Hello and welcome to Designer's Voice, audio conversations on design which inform, challenge and inspire. My name's Alice Bryan. I'm a furniture designer and editor with over 20 years experience of working in design. It is always a pleasure and a privilege to have the opportunity to learn, whether you're learning in an educational setting, from industry leaders or from your peers. And that is exactly what we're here to do today. We will all have the opportunity to learn from my guests, Professor Rebecca Early and Professor Gareth Williams. And it'll be my job today to nudge and guide the conversation along so that we can all eavesdrop together. And before I hand this conversation over to Gareth and Becky, I'm just going to take a moment to introduce my guests in more detail. I want to start my introduction to Professor Gareth Williams by telling you about the first time I met Gareth over 20 years ago, but hopefully it doesn't feel like quite that long, does it, Gareth? In his role as curator of 20th century and contemporary furniture at the V&A, Gareth welcomed all of the first year students on my degree course into the V&A, where we were given white gloves and an exhibit chair to measure and record before we went back to the studio and created drawings and scale models. What an enormous privilege and I suspect a particularly rare opportunity it was and what a pleasure it was to meet Gareth. More importantly, whilst at the V&A, Gareth drove the profile of contemporary design by curating or contributing to more than 15 successful design exhibitions and permanent gallery redisplays. Gareth followed that role at the V&A with five years of se as senior tutor at the RCA world-renowned design products programme before moving to Middlesex University, first as Professor and Head of Design and since 2022 as Deputy Dean for Quality, Enhancement and Development for the Faculty of Arts and Creative Industry. Gareth's focus is now on design, not in individual disciplines, but rather on how design and the creative industries are taught. And my second guest today is Professor Rebecca Early. When I sat down to write this introduction, it seemed like a bit of a daunting task. How could I condense her career and ongoing projects into just a few hundred words? No doubt there will be bits that I've missed and Becky will need to fill in the gaps within her conversation with Gareth. Becky is UAL Chair of Circular Design Futures and the founder and leader of multiple research centres at Chelsea College of Arts, University of the Arts London. She's a researcher and award-winning team leader with her research encompassing making materials, prototyping, exhibition curating and writing. The threads throughout Becky's research, workshops, communication and textiles work are those of sustainability and activism. Her work has been drawn together through not only the co-founding of World Circular Textiles Day launched in 2022, but also through her book, Design Materials and Making for Social Change, publi published recently in June 2023. In their conversation today, Becky and Gareth will chat about how design is taught and the future of design education. And we're going to begin that conversation today with this question. When we talk about design education, what do we mean and where does it currently stand? That's such a huge question, isn't it, to, to begin with. But I, I'd like to pick on, on something that you said. Uh, your first experience of uh, being taught about design was to get your hands on it and to, to examine uh, uh, the chairs that you were invited to to study. So it really was a practical exercise. It was um, giving you an opportunity to 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 handle the materials and to look at the structures of the of of, of, of furniture. So uh, that's one way that design hasn't changed. We've always taught design through learning how to make things. It's a practical subject, isn't it? Uh, now we'll probably end up talking a lot more about the, the challenges to that now because the world is a very different place. And for lots of reasons, I don't think the v &A would let you come in now and <laughs> glove, white gloves or not to um, to uh, play with the, 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 the collection. Um, but the, my point really is about uh, uh, design is learnt through looking and handling 
and experiencing um, uh, the world around us. Is that a good place to start? Yeah, very. I mean, I think it's changed hugely in the time I've been here um, at UAL, which is, I studied here in 92 and to 94, and then I've been teaching since 96. Um, I do mostly research now, and my teaching is more with PhD students. Um, but where is design now? I mean, it's, we're asking different questions. Design has always been about asking a question and then finding an answer. Um, and understanding the context um, that you're making that for. And yeah, the world is such a different place. Our idea of of, of what needs to be done is so different. Um, I remember always being asked to sort of design something for these imaginary clients. And I think as a 20 year old, I just didn't know what other people were about. You know, I, I didn't know who these clients were. I couldn't afford the kind of things I was designing printwear and swimwear for and and so you're kind of disconnected yeah. and I think for me the the great thing that's changed over this period of time is that we're now much more able to be connected with what we're designing for through materials or through the internet which remember of course we didn't have no, when we were studying no. um we are flooded with information and yeah it's more difficult probably as designers now to sort of filter that well that's a social problem for everybody isn't it filtering information and and and, and working out what's what's important prioritizing any information you get um one thing that is the same though i think from when we were students uh and students of design today you're still you're still a 20 year old you're still emerging you're still finding out who you are and, or, and what you want and what the world is like so the context may be different but the the, the sort of the generational thing is the same. You're still a, you're still a young person, yeah. so um, design. We're talking about design education. Uh, design education that we're involved with is still very much focused on on that that you know three year degree for an eighteen to twenty one year old. Um, a, a very traditional model of design, and and we 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 teach in in places that look a bit old fashioned sometimes. You know the art school. You know. S -s -s it has a sort of image of of history and convention and these sort of disciplinary silos and uh and they don't really they're not really when you actually dig into it they're not they don't reflect the world very well any longer they don't they don't reflect the industry that that the students are likely to go into and work in and the sort of movement and the the sort of transitions that they're going to have to make so yeah in a way to still have siloed workshop practices is um is problematic um but on the other hand, we need the sort of hands-on knowledge of materials and yeah. making and craftsmanship. Otherwise, we can't deliver on the visions that yeah, can be yeah, yeah. dreamt up by AI now. You know, we, we, we actually need to, to learn the skills of, of uh, making and design. Yeah. I mean, I love it when I go uh, around different art schools and you go into the, the print room and there is a, a you know, hand printing press and there are um, drawers of, of lead type. I mean, completely obsolete technology, you know, obsolete before we were born, really. And, um, and yet it's still there. There's still that tradition. But there is, that can lead to, to a kind of idea that uh, design education is about um, keeping traditions alive in a sort of as if you're a museum, you know, to to make sure that somehow some kind of traditional making skills are are retained and not lost at all. I don't think that's what we're really for. We're not here to kind of save history. We're here to 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 shape the future, aren't we, as design educators? We're here to take the best things forward and leave the worst things behind. You know, <laughs> I mean, from my point of view, as a sort of linear to circular researcher, you know, I want to know that we're taking the materials that have a lighter footprint and uh, a positive social story mm -hmm. with us into our wardrobes rather than bright orange PVC mm -hmm. 1960s capes. You know, like we do have a role as designers to evaluate and to decide on, on a progressive way to, to move forward. Yes, that's true. But then we start talking, then very quickly we're getting into ethics as if we are the arbiters of, of some sort of moral dimension around design. Is that the role of a design educator to, to make those choices? Or are we really here to uh, help shape the critical skills of the, of 
of the next generation of designers to make their own minds up. They may decide, for whatever reasons, that uh, bright orange PVC is the future and it is right. Uh, are we there to Ooh, tell them I don't know about that. Um, yes, no, I'm pushing no point, I know. But... Um, you know, actually, I think we should be teaching ethics, um, ethical uh, production, ethical uh, consumption uh, in light of climate emergency, mm -hmm. uh, carbon, water, chemical pollution. You know, from my point of view, I come from an industry which is hugely polluting and wasteful. And so there's absolutely no way we can have in the curriculum a kind of just ignorance to those impacts. And so by mentioning PVC, it's actually a really good example of a material that was popular from a fashion point of view, but um, kind of irrelevant now yes. um, for what it, it could do. And, and we have better alternatives. Um, so... We do have to teach an awareness around materials, their footprint, um, and how we use them and why we're using them. Yes, I, I, I agree with completely with that. But I think that um, there are many ways to skin a cat, aren't there? Uh, and so um, the climate emergency, we accept there's a climate emergency, but there are very many ways that, that designers can respond to that. And um, it could be to do with the, the, the kind of materials they're using. It could be to do with the scale of which they're, they're, they're designing for production. It could be about where things are made, who's making them. There's lots of different ways. And none of those things actually join together in a seamless way. They're all going to be, they're all about value judgments and, you, and um, making a decision about uh, the, the, the least impact that you can make in a certain aspect. There's always going to be an, asp uh, an impact on the planet for, if you're making anything. So... I think we have to be careful not to dictate the terms of how our student designers make their own judgments. We have to be teaching them how to make the judgments at all and let them decide whether um, it's best to not make anything at all or whether it's best to only use organic materials or whether it's best to rely on science, whatever it is, because all of those things are contradictory. Oh, I don't know whether they're contradictory. There's certainly a push and pull. Um, and there is, there's a little bit more than a, a kind of uh, value judgment on, on things in that in terms of producing designers, educating designers to go into the fashion uh, in, and textile industry, you know, the legislation is changing the shape of business so quickly now. Um, you know, in the last week, we've had an, an announcement about um, extended producer responsibility and companies coming from the EU, which will mean that designers now, the companies will be responsible for end of life and future processing of materials. So the judgments are actually sort of based within something that can be calculated and can be legislated for. Now, I can talk to you about that and we can sort of understand it, but the students don't want to hear that when they're working no. on a project. What they're interested in is creativity, self-expression, a portfolio bursting with colour and ideas that will get them a job and maybe setting up their own brand and, you know, yes. doing magic with their knitting needles that will impress their mom. You know, like I know that the... Uh, what the mindset is of that wonderful 20 year old, um, because I was one <laughs> and in many ways I still am one and I've been surrounded by them for 27 years. But I also feel as a design educator, a huge responsibility to tell them about what I've seen and what I, I can see coming, I suppose, based on my research and now my understanding of the whole system because those things push and pull each, at each other. They don't contradict each other. They actually work together in a system, but we often don't have sight of the whole system, do we? So maybe what we have to be doing as design educators is being system educators. And it's not, it's not enough to master your discipline and master your materials in a kind of traditional art school model. Um, it's you really need to know the context in which you're going to be operating in a much broader way. You need to know the economics. You've got to understand the the, the business in which you're going to be working. You've got to understand the, the politics around it. You've got to know the regulations to an extent or know how they're impacting. You've got to understand 
um, the environmental context that you're working in. So that's a lot more than being able to draw beautifully or make a, a gorgeous sample of something. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to be a, a bit of an artist, a bit of a scientist, a bit of an activist, a bit of an econo economist, uh, uh, all of those things. Yeah. Designers have to be very, very multi-skilled. And, uh, and yet, I'm not sure that our education is quite as round as that. It's not. And, and you know, I wrote something a while ago, uh, which was challenging the idea of a T-shaped designer mm -hmm. uh, into an I-shaped designer, which introduced sort of self-reflection, criticality, collaboration, and, and sort of more human skills and reflective skills, essentially. But um, it is about systems design. That's quite exciting as a design educator that we're finally we can call it something and we can mm -hmm. bring in new skills and methods and we can bring in new experts to help us. And it is important that designers understand much more about the system within which they mm -hmm. work. But, and I think I'm coming back to your point, actually, I don't expect them to be the systems designer or to actually call themselves a systems designer or even have that skill set. I would encourage the students to be ready to collaborate in a mm -hmm. way in which is so different from, I mean, we used to go, oh, let's do a collaborative project. Okay, let's work with knitwear, with print, with a fashion student, and maybe somebody from marketing. You know, like it, it, it was a much more traditional idea of collaboration. And now it's, it's terrifically exciting because we have this kind of complex collaboration approach now where we need to be working with the farmers. We need to be working with the shop assistants and the, everybody because everybody's part of a circular system. Um, so for textile designers now, I see this, this from an educational point of view, such an exciting potential for the curriculum to include how do you have a conversation like the student in this room, Sana, has had with barbers and barber shops and collected the hair and then made, you know, how do you do that? How do you make something tangible and real and then go back to them with something useful to them to change their lives? The, the project you're talking about, um, using human hair to, 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 as, a, as a material, um, is a wonderful example of how design, uh, all of design practices are actually about communication, really, making tangible an idea or a concept in this instance it's about um inserting uh, into the um material cycle into fabrication commenting on how things are made and 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 finding a uh, an obsolete material or it's not an obsolete but a, a waste material that is and then finding use for it as a stand in we can now use those ideas to look at for all sorts of other materials that could be then um, upcycled in this way. So storytelling and communicating is something that I'm really interested in, how that runs across so many different kinds of uh, design practices. And it's a really useful way to unpack the teaching of it because it's um, uh, it, it, in my faculty, uh, we have illustrators and we have filmmakers, obviously they're storytellers. We have um, actors, they're, they're the yeah. theatre makers are selling to, telling stories. But so are the interior designers. They're, they're coming up with scenarios of how people are going to live and how communities are working together and making it real, kind of somehow bringing those um, less tangible ideas and, and giving them some sort of shape and form. So that's the designer's gift, isn't it? Mm -hmm. To be able to, to uh, communicate ideas visually and, um, and, and materially uh, to, to, for the betterment of the Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I think every, every article I write concludes with, yeah, why aren't designers communicating better, you know, and, and why are we so sort of silent and, you know, not using language in the way we could or methods in the way we could to build bridges, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I've sort of run projects where I've taught my team to podcast or, you know, like mm -hmm. it, we need to improve the way that um, we, we communicate as designers because we might dream up the story in material form or product form or concept form and we might make it, and we might have a brief there, which may tell a story, but we don't actually communicate the story very often. You know, I kind of tried to push my, my silent students in front of the camera and say, let's learn to talk about your work, because that will actually be a huge skill in the workplace that you well, need. Well, th th that's true, but equally, the, the, the outputs that they make have to speak for themselves. Once the student has left the room, the work has got to tell us all about 
itself has got to speak, it's got to communicate. If it doesn't communicate, it's not really worked. In the same sense that in a, in a very um, commercial aspect, you know, if a, if a product doesn't sell itself off the shelves, the designers and the, the manufacturer are no longer with it. It's got to sell itself when it's sat on the shelf in John Lewis. You know, it's got to communicate. It's got to, it's got to resonate with its potential consumer. So communication yeah, runs think, right the way through all of the all design practice into the output. I'm, I'm coming from a textile perspective, the silent part of the supply chain, the mm -hmm. word textile hidden behind the fashion designer, the textile designer not credited for the final beautiful cashmere scarf with the label on it, you know, and actually the incredibly detailed, well-researched, highly technical work that goes into making a, wo a sample of a woven cloth to what extent does it tell a story? You know, sometimes mm -hmm. the designer's job finishes at a sort of a point at which it needs others to tell the story or it needs something else to bring it to life. Or so, and I'm aware that not everybody wants to be a performer and storyteller. So that's not, not really what I'm sort of saying. It's more, it's more to be less isolated. I think it's about the idea that it's you, your career and your design idea that you go into the world with, but more maybe you've through education been helped to find your tribe your system your community the place you want to see yourself flourishing in the future and you go out there with the skills to connect with others so perhaps uh design education isn't over well it, it's not there's no perhaps about this design education is not only about training designers we've got plenty of designers out there mm -hmm. uh, but there are so many other careers in the broader design industry that um, that a design education can support, especially if you were talking particularly about kind of the technical skills to to design and develop textiles there that goes uncredited. Most of us don't even know what those roles are, mm -hmm. and somehow someone has found their way into them, and they've probably done a design degree to start with. Mm -hmm. But I'm really also very interested now in, in how we should be teaching creativity as a. That's really what we're teaching, and. Uh, uh, that you can go and use in the broader world beyond the design industries and beyond the creative industries. And that, that it's, a, it's, a, it's a way of approaching problem solving that we're really teaching. Uh, and that can be um, beneficial to, to all of us. You know, you can go and apply that in, the, in, in, in um, healthcare or in um, social sciences, you know, or whatever your sector is, not the design world in the kind of close knit world of uh, you know fabricating and making your own outputs uh, but in the broader society gareth all of the points that you and becky have already touched upon what do they look like and how are they reflected within the programming that you do for your courses in, it, how do you touch upon those within the actual teaching elements okay it's a good question i think that comes down to designing your degree courses to include authentic assessments you know it's a horrible kind of um higher education sort of sounding term but uh, um it's making sure that students get the opportunity to practice what they're learning uh, in a way that they they might have to actually demonstrate that when they get out into the into the world and in, into the world of work so if you're uh, a, a, a textile designer we're talking a lot about textile designer um don't write an essay about the history of knitting. I mean, you're never going to have to write an essay about the history of knitting. Don't ask them to do that. Mm -hmm. Maybe think about uh, framing that as a kind of some sort of industry report that you could um, need to look at the history of knitting because you're going to reflect upon how to make it better for a particular context or something like that. So it's about authentic assessment tasks that actually relate to real industry experiences and real industry needs in whatever the discipline is that's being taught. Does that answer to that? I think it does. Becky, is that, is that your experience of, of what that looks like in the programming as well? Um, yeah, I'd, 100%. I mean, there's, I, I agree with you, although we'd get a lot out of looking back through archives of an incredible knitwear. It's when you look at the, the industry you're going to go and work in that the real questions pop up. And it might be about the preservation of the Aaron or something, you know. But, but yes, it has to be a contemporary question that's, going to the exploration of that question is going to lead to some interesting insights that will be of benefit. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote my undergraduate thesis on women and feminism uh, and fashion, mm -hmm. and I'm still 
using those questions today, uh, very much so. And um, and then later on, it was sort of print design, textiles, and communication for sustainability, and that was in 1994. Um, so you know, those sort of essay tasks absolutely should be about where you see your future self. Um, but drawing on the expertise and the rich history of the area that you found yourself in. But what you're really learning is criticality, isn't it? And critical skills and 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 expression and communication. That's what the the, the assessment is. That and so um, we like to. Um, build in lots of opportunities for students to present, to stand up and actually talk about their work or their ideas rather than writing them down and submitting them on a bit of paper or these days, you know, through the computer. Uh, it's much more um, vital and authentic to be able to stand up and talk about an idea and present an idea, make a pitch, yeah. because those are the kind of skills that people are going to need when they've graduated more than sitting down and writing 3,000 words about something. Although different i'm not i'm not deliberately disagreeing with you this is a we're bouncing around here but you've made me think of something we were talking about at lunch which is i think the future for design education is very much about appreciating neurodiversity and all kinds of diversity and the standing up in front of your peers is although i'd like to be giving coaching and mentoring and support for the students that find it terrifying might always be terrifying for some uh, who have chosen the visual medium and material materials and making and design as their way because some maybe it doesn't mean that they have to be vocally outspoken um in which case what you're uh, what we can ask them to do and i know that you do and, and we do too at ual is choose a format to yes, exactly express yourself choose the best way to express yes, yourself like a, the great joke about you know doing a dance for your for your PhD viva instead of presenting and defend you know like what is the appropriate form of expression for the message you want to get across and um i just i you know years of working with young female students in textiles um who find it utterly terrifying to talk in front of mm. of, of of a group of people and it sort of frustrates me because i because it is i mean it's not that common anymore but why they are so silent you know I, for me and, and the feminist sort of side of teaching textiles these days and design education is we, we keep ourselves somehow in these positions that were created for textiles in the industrial revolution mm -hmm. in these roles in these behaviors in and actually, I sort of feel like that goes through the family and the parenting and right through the education as well. And I just want to blow it all up sometimes. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, radical courses mm -hmm. in design, design thinking and making is sort of what excites me. I think there's a, there's a, uh, a real tension, though, between wanting to have a, a radical arts education and the structures of education itself which are not radical and are very kind of uh, scaffolded and with a whole load of jargon and expectations and learning outcomes and credits and modules and da 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 da, da which are there, it often feels to stifle any attempt to do it differently and to, to, to appeal to a different kind of audience and to deliver a different outcome. And so we, as design educators, trying to shape what a, a design degree uh, could and should be you have to kind of play both games you want to to blow it up you want to smash it up you want to be able to kind of give students um the choices to to do things their own way and to express themselves and make their own choices for the future but they've still got to conform to some sort of scaffolded structure that can be measured and assessed and Credited quality and marked and quality controlled Checked, yeah. and you know uh, uh which they can they I imagine it's the same in many disciplines, but it feels acutely the case in design and art education that it's you're, you're kind of forcing a, a square peg into a round hole. Yeah, trying to measure something which, or express something which is inexpressible. Or, yeah, 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 yeah. It's it's uh, something that we've struggled with, isn't it? Really, in art and design education, it's a problem for education. Uh, but 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 what we do know about design is that it's very good at. Um, uh, problem solving against constraints. So uh, if, if if we have a, a difficult brief, you've got to make your, you've got to write your program, your your degree course um, to fit into three years and a number of learning weeks. And mm. you've got to scaffold it and you've got to make it, you know, meet these kind of elements and match those kind of learning outcomes. We can do that. We're good at that. We're good at kind of 
dealing with a brief because we understand what a brief is and we know how to to make something new out of a, a out of a uh, a, um, a boundaried contained brief i think that's my my problem with it all though is that you know so so and i it took me a while to understand this um having sort of like developed these research units and all of these insights and we were working with industry with big industry and coming back with the problems and challenges that they had and then tackling them uh, through research projects and then having tools and ideas to feed back into the curriculum. So we were literally saying this massive corporate fashion giant has these problems. You will be able to help them and solve it if you start thinking like this and learn these things. But then you get presented with well, the curriculum has all of these moments in it, all very well organized with all of these checkpoints and then all of these measures. And suddenly, you know, you're told there's no room. Mm -hmm. There's no room to change. There's no room to bring in that thinking. Because if you, and literally this has happened many times, what goes, they say to me, Becky, what goes then? Shall we not teach them this? Shall we not yeah. teach them this? And, you know, that's made me want to be quite radical because I'm like, yeah, chuck all of that out because you're not going to need that in the next climate era. You know, yes. like, yes. So where, how do you make the curriculum change and evolve while still off keeping everybody happy in this? Yeah, yeah, that, it, it's it's a, an unsolvable problem actually. You because we we do end up with our our um, subject kind of growing and growing and growing. We want you to be an expert in the tradition and history of the of the particular discipline that you've chosen to come and study. The title that we've given you, you know, with ceramics. You know, you've got to know all about the history of ceramics, and you're going to send at least half your degree, you know, doing that, only to then throw it all out the window and do a complete, you know, reinvent the potter's wheel probably reinvent yeah. everything yeah. and um and and challenge it you can't know how to break the rules until you know the rules yeah basically but somehow you've got to fit all of that into, into but it's the years. rules i mean i suppose because it is for me about climate we've got to this situation with the planet which is critical because of rules that were written to suit you know commercial exploitative mm -hmm. needs so I guess any time now someone says rules, I go, yes, but are the rules right? You know, yeah. like, I think I want to teach the students to question all the rules and to propose something different. So there's a huge opportunity for us to uh, completely reshape design education by looking at the, at the issues that design can can. Um, the challenges for design mm. uh, in the world, rather than the the disciplinary basis of each different parts of design. Mm. So, sorry, a very badly um, worded um, uh, statement, but it's it, 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 we could have a degree on climate change, design and climate change, let's say, and it doesn't matter you you whether you're a filmmaker or you're a textile designer, you can still you know you're, what you're doing is using your knowledge to address. Uh, that big challenge, that global challenge. Um, we work a lot with the, the UN Sustainable Development Goals and, and try and map them onto our, our program design where possible. And obviously, not every every discipline is going to address many, usually a few of them. There's quite a lot of them. But as long as you can kind of see the trajectory for that discipline, see how it could how it might uh, address a bigger issue, it feels like it's it's really is. Um, uh, not just about itself. You're not just teaching uh, a discipline about the discipline itself. You're teaching the application of that discipline for a bigger problem. That's probably what is, I'm going. Which is, you know, and this is the thing. It's like, when do you bring in these questions? And we were talking as, at the beginning about this sort of, you know, education students are getting from like 19 to 22, the three-year mm. undergrad. Um, so, you know, here now, MA courses are where these more extreme yeah. questions are posed. And we've got MA regenerative design. We've got MA bio design, both of those at St. Martin's. MA global design challenges, which is here at Camberwell. MA sustainable futures. You know, like the MA courses yeah. are more and more open in discipline and really they've got the the, the, the climate questions at yeah, heart. and and perhaps that's because students who are going onto those programs have some sort of 
prior knowledge yeah, of, yeah. of probably gained from a, a particular disciplinary perspective yeah. or leave actually leave a you know employment after many years and want to yes. retrain and sort of put their experience to solve bigger problems well that introduces the the, the, the thing we were talking about at lunch as well which, which is maybe design education is less and less about uh, uh upskilling um young people uh, or you know, first training. It's it's more about upskilling people further on in their careers to to meet the needs. So um, uh, we should be less focused on the eighteen to twenty one year old market for lots of different reasons. Not least because we can't afford to train mm. undergraduate students any longer because of freezes in the student grant, etc. Mm. But it's really uh, uh, about um, lifelong learning, which is the you know the buzzword in student finance these days it's all about giving us all opportunities all through our lives to 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 gain new skills and there i think there's huge opportunity for design education because you're 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 starting from a different point of view you're you're teaching people who already got their own prior learning in something and they and and a known set of judgment to bring to bear yeah yeah lifelong learning is and and sort of apprenticeships you were talking about at lunch and um you know sort of professional development um as well as all of the sort of uh satellite places that we're now extending our our teaching to that was a really interesting point we were yeah Yeah. partnerships uh with uh um, other education at other universities around the world we do a lot of that in Middlesex so or with um, small specialist uh, providers in in the UK that we're validating degrees for so there's a very mixed economy it's not mm. the old the edifice of the art school teaching its three years degrees and 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 uh, issuing forth these new designers mm. uh, is sort of not there any longer it's much more of a mixed economy and of, of different kinds of people this also incidentally helps us um, diversify the the, the the design industry, which we know is not very diverse, it's, it's very poorly diverse, yeah. um, because it's still seen as a rather a, um, a nice, desirable thing for certain kinds of uh, student demographic to come and study. It's not very open to lots of parts of society. But uh, if we can kind of break that down a bit by um, delivering our training to in different kinds of ways, different stepping on and stepping off points. You know, I can see this is nothing to do with design at all. This is to do with program design. Yes, and yes. Curriculum well, design and, you know, structures of higher education. But it's making me really excited because it means that you can, you know, you can see the way that we can develop design approaches now in a much broader landscape, a much bigger spectrum of, of skill sets and people and opportunities. Yes. I think there's been so much sort of frustration with the courses um in that kind of classic shape that i do know of colleagues that whose kids probably in the past would have gone on to art and design school and now they're choosing to go out and be entrepreneurs and do something else with the idea that they can come back and do the training later whether yeah. that's a short course here or an ma eventually there or you know there's they know that they've got more choice Yes. They know they can access information in different ways. By the time they get to the end of school and they're 18, 19, you know, they kind of want a different experience from life. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we are looking at a future landscape where there's going to be a huge range of offers now. Yes. Uh, and we have to, as art and design educators, reinvent ourselves. Well, I, and on top of that, there's the, the, the challenge of, of new technologies, which mean you sort of don't really need the 10,000 hours to become an expert any longer. You know, that sort of idea that you've got to really kind of hone your skill because uh, we were talking at lunch about um, uh, uh, generative AI, which kind of cuts out the kind of um, development stage. It almost doesn't cut them out, but it speeds mm. up design development ideas or it could potentially do that. So actually the the premise of how we teach art and design is rather undercut now because of the the, the potential for the technologies to replace a lot of that thinking or, or speed it up. So we have to be training designers to to think differently and to be adaptable and ad- resilient yes, exactly. and confident and to just move and explore. Yes. Um yeah, rather than try to sort of ban and bar and uh, reject. We can't be luddites about no. anything. I mean, surely the the whole 
you know, Luddites themselves showed it's pointless to fight against new technologies in design. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. What do you think that the impact has been that there's been such a dramatic reduction in the take up at GCSE level of design and technology? It's, it's down by about 50% now, isn't it? Yeah, compared to, I think, 2009, um, uh, one report read. I mean, I, it's, it's so frustrating. It's so clear that uh, creativity, innovation is so important for our economy, for our well-being, for, you know, imagining and making uh, our futures. And yet we're not teaching the very tools for our next generation to be able to do that. And, and there seems to be this you know, crazy idea that somehow you can embed creativity in every subject, which is what I've been told every time I've questioned various headmasters, um, you know, and yes, but that doesn't seem right. That's like saying you can find a French word in every subject and you don't need to learn French. I mean, it, it's scary. And even with my own kids who are sort of they've grown up in a, an arty family, as my parents would call it. Um, they had to think carefully about which options to take. And they have both opted for GCSE art. And now my son's dead studying A-level art. And even though myself and my partner have got sort of successful careers and livelihoods, we still have friends and family saying, oh, that's a waste. That's a waste of an A-level to do A-level art. And there he is, you know, oil painting, with a big grin on his face, really happy, really loving it. And I'm thinking, what, what else would you be studying at 16, 17, but something that puts a huge grin on your face? You know, we've sort of, we, we've sort of arrived at this point where we don't really understand the flow, the, 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 the um, what's it called? The pipe. The pipeline. The pipeline, the yeah. pipeline you know, and, and we're panicking because of austerity and economic pressures. Um, in terms of sort of creating a fake security, I think a very short term uh, idea of of what will what's needed, um, mm -hmm. and I think it's it's hard to think long term. I think we we kind of know that, but it's very difficult. I think the, the by um, turning off the pipeline in mm -hmm. um, um, secondary education of of art and design subjects. Um, I, it, has a terrible effect on on higher education because it's it means that we are not getting the the pipeline of students coming through in a purely market terms to actually populate the programs that we we all have uh, to make them sustainable so that we can actually run them at all let alone the fact that we're no longer able we that we face existential issues that maybe we've you know lots of courses will have to close or even entire schools perhaps um or colleges uh, but really the big issue is that we're not um, supplying the people with the right skills that society needs in the future uh, because uh, creativity is cut off at, uh, you know, for kids. So I think that we have to just always keep banging on about the value of the creative industries to the economy, to well-being, to society, keep making the case for how creativity can be applied in other contexts, as I was mentioning earlier on, that if that's what the value of an arts education is. It's, uh, it's to do with um, how it improves everybody and everybody's quality of life. If you do an arts education as a school child and then you go and become a physicist, you're probably a better physicist for it, mm. you know, because you've learned problem solving and you've learned to, to rationalize and you've learned to evaluate things. That's the value of an arts education as well as being able to be a practitioner. It's wonderful that your son is an oil painter, but he's actually also learning lots of other kind of soft skills that are that could be useful if he wants to go and become a, a you know, work on an oil rig. He could be using that kind of training, that independent thinking that you learn through an arts education. But I just think like happy quality of life for not very much money. <laughs> Crafting, <laughs> making, creativity, taking photo, you know, that part of your brain which just sparks joy and, and yes. you get a buzz from. I mean, are we going to, you know, what, what are people doing for that buzz? Well, we kind of know the kids are vaping and, you know, looking for more, more and more extreme highs. I mean, this is a fact, you know, the take up of alternatives to get a kind of dopamine hit or to get into flow a similar state to flow and the fact that we're not recognizing that as we 
bring up young people is is, is scary to me. But this is a real challenge, though, for us as design ed- educators, because we can only the the only courses that are going to survive are ones that that generation, those kids are going to kind of want to come and do, or that their parents will let them do. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so uh, it, it makes it very difficult. We know all sorts of wonderful things that we would love to be able to teach and lots of ways of thinking and lots of ways of collaborating and lots of new ideas and ways that could improve the world. That's our view, you know, when we're kind of getting on a bit maybe. And uh, we've got to also follow what the what students want for themselves and for their the, for their future and the kind of people that they want to be in the kind of world that they want to build. But unfortunately, they don't know what that is because they haven't been given the building blocks to think about the options and the and the, the creative potential in the right kind of way. So it's no point in us having a, a fantastic degree in applied imagination, which I there is a degree at CSM on that. I don't know that a 17 year old would understand what that meant. They're not going to sign up for that degree. They might degree. come they might come later after having some industry experience and being stripped of their imagination <laughs> and coming back to it. They but, might do, yes, you but know, uh, the, but the, we're talking about education for, you know, after school. The, the, you but know, then, the, you know, and we were talking about um young people defining what it is they want in order to make the world that they desire and what they feel drawn to. But we, we're we the educators here. We're the experienced um, people who have got stuff to teach as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we are drawing on our experience in a critical and relevant way to yes. help them on their journey. But our job, I think, is to hold their hand, not to not to put our hands behind them and push them in a particular direction. It's to give a to create safe spaces where people can discover themselves and find out what direction they want to take and not to judge them about that, to create the, that That's the real magic of, of, a, of a creative education, I think, is to create that, that safe area where a young person can discover their creativity, whatever yeah, you're that might right. be. You're so right. I so remember being in uh, the studio at various moments in my sort of six years at art college and, and just being having a wonderful time and then having my tutor say, oh, they'll never want that. (laughs) Or you're doing it all wrong. It's not done like that in industry. And I'm like, well, I might find a different way. But I find, I think we all find now (laughs) that the the, the, big challenge on um, encouraging students to, to, to let themselves fail. Do you know Mm. what I mean? And, or, or discover why some their work hasn't not worry when it fails, mm. not worry when it hasn't worked, because it it is working because they're learning from it. But uh, uh, our, our schooling system is, is doesn't work like that, and it's all about the grade, and it's all about some measure of success. And so students are terrified of doing it wrong. And <gasps> an arts education is all about learning through doing it wrong. MA well. design failures. There That's we are. the new course. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So I think before we um, finish the conversation entirely, it would be really exciting to finish on a really positive note. So I would like to know what you what you think is possibly the most exciting thing that we can hope to see in design education in the future. The most exciting thing in design education in the future. Uh, I don't know that this is a... Um, uh, this is a wish rather than a, yes. a, 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 a prediction. My wish would be that uh, our politicians and our policymakers would listen and realise the potential for design education to have real reach and impact across uh, uh, a lot of society and take us more seriously and allow us those spaces and resources to make those mistakes and to research and to find out and to reset uh, things, to 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 stop haranguing us and give us some room. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I suppose from a sort of from my point of view, um, I think the potential for us to work on solutions and better futures will it is incredibly exciting mm-hmm. whether that's through materials or technology or 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 systems and service design um you know zero waste and, and recycling and regenerative design it doesn't really matter but the thing i really want to see is 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 climate feminism i want to see women 
in design, really own their ideas, uh, speak up and propose changes that will benefit uh, the strive towards equity. Let's just say equity everywhere, you know, but improvement, just improving people's lives, improving your own life, improving other people's lives through design. Mm -hmm. Gareth, Becky, it has been just a joy to sit and listen to your conversation today. Thank you so much for being part of this audio series. Thanks for, Thank you. Us. Thanks for bringing us together. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. And um, if you have listened to this episode of Designer's Voice and you've enjoyed it, please do share it with your friends and colleagues and follow us on Instagram at Designer's Voice. Thank you.